So we're looking at some common problems. Um, one of the key problems that you find, even on very, very large developments, is that the stakeholder requirements uh, and the, the client's requirements tend to quite often to be ina inadequately defined. They could be really little more than a wish list. Um, quite often they're not well structured, um, they're not formal, um, they sort of convey the overall wishes of the client and the main stakeholders, but they're not necessarily rigorously defined. So, um, so what tends to happen is that um, contractors who've worked in these large, on these large projects before, um, could be a large rail project, um, pharmaceutical problem project, whatever, it could be subcontracted aspects of that. Um, they sometimes don't, uh, they, they think they've done it all before and they know what's required. They look at the stakeholder requirements and they say, yeah, we've done this before, um, we'll go off and design you a system or part of a system and no problem. Um, even if they do get some more detailed requirements flowing down from the stakeholders requirements to form more formal system requirements, most often they don't provide any linkage back to the stakeholder requirements um, and to their ultimate designs. So the problem you've got is that you can't prove that you've actually done what the stakeholders want unless you have an auditable traceable path back to those requirements. You can never say for sure you've met the requirements. Um, so let's just um, what tends to happen later in, later in the project life cycle is that the legal team become involved and they, they basically typically advise the client not to let the main works contracts out you know, because you have the, the business plan, you have your stakeholders requirements and then ultimately you get to the phase in the project life cycle where you want to get um, the main contractors involved and you want to go out to tender, you want to award contracts. So it used to be that um, designs were done, early designs were done by the client's project team and those designs were made available to contractors. The problem with that is that legally if a, if a contractor and their subcontractors work to that design, they adopt that design and for whatever reason it doesn't work, they, they could always claim um, legally that they've only done what they were asked to do. So the advice from the lawyers is to only award contracts against full specified sets of requirements. But even if that happens, typically they don't, they're not linked um, so that you don't have this audible traceability. Um, and what, long term what happens is when the, the main contractor's designs are finished in more detail, the client gets his specialist um, consultants to have a look at the designs. It may take six, eight months to consider the designs and then they'll, they'll turn around and say, well, that's not what I wanted. Um, if it's a rail project, the radius of this, this curve is too tight, it's going to create too much noise. That's not acceptable because we've, we've, we've given guarantees that we'll keep the noise limits down and so on. So the client's not happy, the contractors aren't happy because they have to get some of the key members of the team back together who by that time are probably on other projects. So it's a highly unsatisfactory situation.